station. Any unattended articles are likely to be removed without warning. This is the Hour of History Cities podcast with your host, Stephen Bauman. The Hour of History Cities podcast, as well as other Hour of History podcasts, can be streamed and downloaded at hourofhistory.com, iTunes, Google Music, our YouTube channel, and tune in. Be sure to also check out our Hour of History blog at hourofhistory.com forward slash blog. And now we begin the Hour of History Cities podcast with your host, Stephen Bauman. Good morning, and welcome to Hour of History. For the next couple weeks, I'm going to do a special series on the city in history, with a special focus on Havana. The reason I've chose Havana is for a couple for a couple reasons, actually. Um, first of all, I'm going to be presenting at a conference in Cuba in May, and I'm going to use that opportunity to travel through the country and ultimately end up in Havana, where a lot of the work I do is based. I write about a uh, Quaker relief operation that took place just outside of Havana during World War II. In order to prepare for that trip, and both as part of a class project that I'm doing this spring, I'm studying the city in history and the place the city has in history. And I've chosen to focus my uh, research on Havana, both to make my journey to Havana more rich and to gain a better understanding of the place in which much of what I study takes place. Uh, in studying Havana, a city that's 500 years old, I originally already focus on a couple different things than someone who might study a city that's been around for a much longer time, say since ancient civilizations like Rome or Athens, Greece. Havana is a little different for a few reasons, not only because it's only 500 years old, which in the grand scheme of things isn't very old for a city, but also because it's an outpost of empire. It wasn't the main city in the Spanish Empire, nor was it even the main city in the Caribbean for a long time. In that way, Havana sort of has a different role as far as the growth of cities do, and that impacts its growth. Now, when thinking about cities, there's a lot to think, and historians usually start with questions. One of the questions I'm asking is, is where does history begin for this city? How do we start? And what were the most important things in making it a city? The, anytime you talk about the case of Christopher Columbus or the New World or the Old World, depending on how you look at it, it becomes a contentious issue of how the historical narrative is shaped. In the case of Cuba, there were indigenous people, the Taino, people who were spread throughout the Caribbean islands, uh, who had been there for a very long time. And there's a great historical record about the Taino. But interestingly enough, no literature really suggests that they were in Havana. Havana is not the original place where Christopher Columbus made landfall. In fact, he makes landfall in uh, much farther south down Cuba's shores, and he sets up the first sort of cities um, closer to the Gulf of Mexico, closer to uh, Santiago de Cuba, closer to Guibara, and the first circumnavigation of Cuba isn't until 1508. So Christopher Columbus makes landfall in 1492, and Cuba isn't fully circumnavigated, and Havana Bay isn't entered, actually, until 1508. So when asking where should history begin for this city, for Havana, uh, especially, you know, these things come to be important when, when celebrations of centennials are thought up and when the narrative of the history of the city is created, it's, it, it's possible to go back to Columbus, it's possible to go back even further to the Taino, but you would have to leave the city of Havana. As far as all the research I've read, the Taino were not in Havana. In fact, it's only important because it's a bay. It's a natural bay around Havana in which it was easy for the Spanish to uh, enter with their ships and to have some rest from their voyages across the sea. Bays are useful for maritime 
operations. There are useful places where the water is not, um, the currents aren't so strong, so ships can can stay in bays and um, and it's possible for for sailors to you know set up camp and so often cities are built around bays so rather than the other you know historical norms around cities where many cities are built around rivers historians have argued that all great cities are built around rivers they need a source of water when William Penn chooses Pennsylvania, well, Philadelphia to settle his, his Pennsylvania colony, he uses two rivers. He has the Delaware River on one side and the Schuylkill River on the other side. So you can, you can have access to the city in, in two ways. Cities that are built as sort of imperial outposts are not built that way. And often they're built around bays because bays are good for loading ships, unloading cargo. And that was exactly the purpose of Havana when it was, when it was first entered. So the rest of Cuba, the rest of the island is in fact inhabited by Taino, indigenous peoples, and the Spanish make short work of them. Those who aren't taken and enslaved are essentially um, essentially destroyed. Essentially a, a genocide is carried out and those who are lucky enough to go in and avoid this sort of genocide that's or capture that the Spanish end up pulling off are um, in they escape inland and they don't interact with the Spanish the Spanish aren't much interested in the inland area of Cuba rather they're interested in it as a place that might have potential for ports and for helping them to extract gold and spoils from the Central and South American lands, so Mexico and South America. So right away, in choosing two objects, which is my goal for the next 10 weeks, in order to represent Havana's history in the court over 20 objects, uh, one has to think about nature, because nature was an important piece of the founding of Havana. Had it not been a natural bay, had it been... it wouldn't have been used. In fact, there were already established towns, villages in Cuba by the indigenous people that probably had better uh, safety records in terms of hurricanes that might not have had as much or might have had more natural resources. So one has to think about the importance of nature in the terms of the founding of Havana. And that's why the first object that I choose in order to represent Havana is the palm tree. Now the palm tree is not necessarily representative of a bay and a mangrove or something of that sort might be more representative, but the palm tree is a symbol that uh, doesn't seem to fade away throughout the 500 years. So it's not only important in establishing the founding of Havana as an important representation of nature, but it's also important as a representation of sort of the, the vital feature of, of nature in this, this establishment of Havana. So not only was the bay important, but also the economy was important and human interaction happens almost immediately with the bay. So as soon as Havana is established, it's also established as an economical trading outpost for the Spanish Empire. So one thing the Spanish have to contend with, even though they have cutting edge maritime technology for the day, is how to transfer all the gold from Central and South America to Spain safely and without losing anything. Now it's quite a ways to sail from Spain, from the Spanish Old World to the Spanish New World or New Spain. So the Spanish needed places along the Caribbean to regroup, to trade, to uh, load ships up with supplies for the long journey. So in that way, Havana becomes a very important post in a very important natural harbor. So the second item I choose to represent that is a Spanish golden coin. So gold establishes the need 
for a sort of center in which to hold the gold while the ship is being loaded to unload goods and it becomes a trading post. So foundational in the birth of Havana as a city is not only nature, not only the fact that it's a natural harbor and there's a place for people to land, but also gold. And the gold stimulates the economy and creates the need for people, more people to come. Not only will gold sort of spark off the beginning of the growth of Havana as a trading post, but it'll also necessitate uh, the growth of the harbor as a bastion, as a way of protecting the gold. So in order to protect all these, all the gold that's being pillaged um, from Mexico and South America, the Cubans, the, the Cuban island is going to have to be inhibited by Spanish soldiers. So by bringing soldiers over to protect the gold, the city begins to grow. So now nature is beginning to be tamed and the city population is beginning to grow. Soldiers are brought over to Havana and that sort of starts the snowball rolling in towards the growth of Havana. And this is back in the 1500s. Now cities have always been sort of capturing the imagination of human civilization. The idea that a bunch of people would live together and have some sort of interactions with each other is an important part of uh, the human experience. And it's something that we should continue to visit, especially nowadays when loneliness and, and isolation is becoming such a big thing, even within cities in our modern society. In fact, the United Kingdom just named a minister of loneliness who's goal is going to be finding ways to make people feel less lonely, people even in cities. And perhaps if we look at the history of cities, we will be able to better find why why this loneliness sort of happens. Is that is that a reason that um, has to do with the cities? Now, Havana's first two streets are in what is what is now called Old Havana, Havana Vieja, the main streets were trades and merchants. So another thing that has to come through this growth of money is merchants. Merchants typically will trade and sell ship parts, things that are necessary for the growth of the ship, for the security of the ship, and they'll do that in exchange for money in hope of making it big and making a little more money that was made in Spain, and then maybe they could build more houses, whatever. They could have a little more success in Spain. That's one side of it. And this week has focused almost entirely on the growth of the economy. Next week is going to focus on the growth of the spiritual within Havana. Because whenever the economy comes, there's a need in these cities to sort of build a spiritual base. And this is the way medieval European cities were built, often with the cathedral in the center. And that's something that these imperial outposts have to come to terms with. Because after all, they were built mostly for the growth of the economy. So where does religion fit into that? If the city is being built for the economy and for the glorification of the empire, how does it come to terms with religion? What is the spiritual center of the city? So in leaving this week, I want to leave with a look back at how cities have been viewed by even more ancient and Bronze Age civilizations. If you read Psalm 48 in the Bible, it's titled The Splendor of the Invincible City. And it's a song that explains, Great is the Lord of the highly praised in the city of our God, the holy mountain, fairest of heights, the joy of all earth, Mount Zion, the heights of Zephon, the city of the great king. God is its citadel, renowned as a stronghold. See, the kings assembled, together they invaded. When they looked, they were as astounded, terrified, they were put to flight. Trembling seized them, their anguish like a woman's labor, when the east wind wrecks the ships of Tarshish. What we had heard we now see in the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God, founded to last forever. 
O God, within your temple, we ponder your steadfast love, like your name, O God. You praise reaches the ends of the earth. Your right hand is fully victorious. Mount Zion is glad. The cities of Judah rejoice because of your saving deeds. Go about Zion, walk all around it. Note the number of its towers, consider the ramparts, examine its citadels, that you may tell future generations, yes, so mighty is God, our God who leads us always. And this sort of divine connection to cities, and it's certainly evoked in the in the Bible, is is something that we'll have to keep in mind as we examine Havana through the growth of its citadels, through the growth of its its uh, its towers, through the growth of its churches, through the relationship it has between the growth of economics, the growth of spirituality, the growth of the Spanish Empire the tense relationship it will have with slaves, with indigenous peoples that have not been uh, already killed off by the 16th century. Havana will have a huge importance, not only in the period of empire, but also going forth through the Cuban Revolution and the Cold War, and even to today. So thank you for joining. Next week, we're going to talk about two more items. We'll go beyond the palm tree, we'll go beyond the gold, and we'll talk about Havana's growth as a city, as an imperial outpost in the Caribbean. Thanks for joining. <laughs>